famine imminent in northern Gaza. NATO leaders deny plans to send troops to Ukraine. Salam Lisa Madani, you're watching World Today. I'm Brendan Lepal. Hope you're doing good. Famine is imminent in northern Gaza, where no humanitarian group has been able to provide aid since 23rd January. The World Food Programme gave a stern warning at a United Nations Security Council meeting yesterday as Israel continues pounding the Gaza Strip with explosives and gunfire. So decided. With a dire humanitarian emergency unfolding in the Gaza Strip and the main UN aid agency there struggling to cope, other bodies have called for help in reaching the thousands of Palestinians in desperate need. And here we are at the end of February with at least 576,000 people in Gaza, one quarter of the population, one step away from famine, with one in six children under two years of age in northern Gaza suffering from acute malnutrition and wasting. And practically the entire population of Gaza left to rely on woefully inadequate humanitarian food assistance to survive. So decided. As aid remains blocked from entering northern Gaza by the Israeli forces and only enters the rest of the territory in drips and drops, UNA chief Martin Griffiths last week wrote to the Security Council calling on members to act to prohibit the use of starvation of civilian population as a method of warfare. Jordan's King Abdullah joined crews dropping aid into the devastated Gaza Strip from on board a Jordanian Air Force plane on Tuesday. The Hashemite Royal Court published a video showing the king aboard the plane and pushing parcels of aid from an open door while larger crates were dropped from the cargo bay. King Abdullah said that humanitarian aid to Gaza must be doubled to prevent a deterioration in a hunger crisis affecting over 2 million people. The flow of aid entering Gaza from Egypt has declined dramatically in the past few weeks, but Israel claims it is not blocking aid and blames the United Nations and the Palestinian side for any delays. Jordan, which the UN and Western donors have turned into a regional hub for humanitarian supplies to Gaza on Monday for the first time, carried out four flights along with the French army to drop food to thousands of displaced people sheltering on the beach. A senior UN aid official told the Security Council that at least 576,000 people in the Gaza Strip, one quarter of the population, are one step away from famine, warning that widespread famine could be almost inevitable without action. Health authorities in Palestine said Israel's air and ground campaign in Gaza has since killed around 30,000 Palestinians. Greece's frigate Hydra departed for the Red Sea to participate in a mission to protect merchant ships from attacks by Yemen's Iran-backed Houthi. Early on Monday, the Greek government approved the country's participation in the European Union naval mission dubbed Unafor Aspides in the Red Sea. Many commercial shippers have diverted vessels following attacks by the Houthis who control much of Yemen and say they are acting in solidarity with the Palestinians as Israel and Hamas wage war in Gaza. Government spokesman Pavlos Marikanis said in a statement that Greece's Security Council approved a proposal by Defence Minister Nikos Dandias for participation in the EU mission. The government said it was important to join the mission as the Houthi attacks have disrupted Greek-owned commercial vessels' activities at the country's biggest port, Piraeus, and some container ships have stopped using it. France, Italy and Germany are also taking part in the EU mission under the codename Aspides, the Greek word for shields. Participating countries will be mandated to protect commercial ships and intercept attacks, but not take part in strikes against the Houthis on land. Prime Ministers of four Central European NATO members said they had no plans to send ground troops to Ukraine after France hinted at the possibility and the Kremlin warned that any such move would inevitably lead to conflict between Russia and NATO. 
French President Emmanuel Macron had said that Western allies should exclude no options in seeking to avert a Russian victory in Ukraine, though he stressed there was no consensus at this stage. The Prime Ministers of the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland and Slovakia distanced themselves from the remarks. Hungary's Viktor Orban and Slovakia's Robert Fiso, who returned to office last year, have also previously said they would not send weapons to Ukraine, while Poland and the Czech Republic have been among Kyiv's strongest military backers. Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk said earlier during a press conference with Czech Prime Minister Peter Fiala, there should not be speculation about possible future circumstances that could change the stance of not deploying troops to Ukraine. Russian Security Council Secretary Nikolai Patrushev, a top ally of President Vladimir Putin, has met Cuba's former leader, Raul Castro, to discuss security cooperation. Images shared by the Cuban government show Patrushev shaking hands with the Cuban leader and in a meeting with other officials. Patrushev also met with the current Cuban president, Miguel Diaz-Canel, who stressed that important steps have been taken in the bilateral relation, including the growth of Russian tourism to the island. According to Russian and United States diplomats, the war in Ukraine has triggered the worst crisis in Russia's relations with the West since the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. After the West slapped what US and European leaders cast as the toughest sanctions ever imposed on a major economy, Russia has turned away from Europe and the United States and has boosted ties with countries in Asia, the Middle East, Africa and Latin America. Putin has also received an invitation to visit Cuba. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky held talks in Saudi Arabia yesterday with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, devoted to the cause of Russia's two-year-old invasion of Ukraine. Zelensky, writing on the Telegram messaging app, said the primary topics of discussions would be Kyiv's peace formula framework for ending the invasion, as well as the return of captives and deported people. The Saudi state news agency said the Crown Prince during the talks affirmed the kingdom's keenness and support for all international endeavors and efforts aimed at resolving the Ukrainian-Russian crisis, reaching peace and continuing efforts to contribute in alleviating the resulting humanitarian impacts. Kiev hopes to hold a peace summit in Switzerland involving the leaders of those nations this spring. Saudi Arabia has previously acted as a mediator in prisoner swaps between Ukraine and Russia. The regional powerhouse, while supporting Kiev, also continues to maintain ties with Russia, which has made Saudi Arabia a go-between country in the war. Zelensky said he was sure his meeting on Tuesday would bring results in this regard. Still to come, solving immigration woes. Texans calls for with Texit. Stay tuned. Political crisis talks called by Senegal's President Macky Sall on Tuesday reached a broad consensus that the presidential vote he postponed could not be held before his mandate ends on 2nd April. Sall's two-day national dialogue aimed at setting a date for the delayed election also advocated the head of state remain in office beyond the end of his term and until his successor is installed. The conclusions go firmly against the view of a widespread political and civic movement, which is demanding the poll be held before 2nd of April. The traditionally stable West African country is grappling with its worst political crisis in decades after Saul's last-minute deferral of the 25th February election. The Constitutional Council overturned the delay, and Saul on Monday launched two days of talks to set a new date, boycotted by major political and social actors. Two committees were formed to discuss the election date and the organization of the period, with the first committee coming to the almost unanimous conclusion that the vote could not be held before 2nd April. The second committee came to a broad consensus in favor of President Saul's remaining in office until a successor is sworn in. The two committees were due to present their conclusions to the president later today. 
Chad will hold the presidential election on 6 May, ending a three-year junta rule when President Mohammad Idris Dabi Itno took power following his father's death while fighting rebels. The 37-year-old was proclaimed head of an army junta after rebels killed his father, Idris Dabi Itno, who had seized power in a coup and ruled the desert nation with an iron fist for three decades. Mohammad Dabi Idno had promised to hand power back to civilians and organize elections within 18 months, but added another two years of transition. The end of the transition period was pushed back to 10 October this year. In mid-January, the ruling Patriotic Salvation Movement, MPS Party, designated Mohammad Dabi Idno as its candidate for the presidential election. Mohammad Dabi Idno has told the African Union he would not run for president, but a new constitution adopted by a mid-December referendum allows him to do so. The Chadian opposition has asked the president not to run for a new term. The leading opposition and civil society grouping, Wakit Tama, has accused the international community and former colonial ruler, France in particular, of supporting dynastic succession and backing Mohammad Dabi Idno's ambition to confiscate power, including by the use of force. At the end of December 2023, a new constitution was adopted after a referendum produced an 86% vote in favour, despite the opposition boycott. South Korean President Yoon suk yeol yesterday vowed to go ahead with a plan to increase the number of students admitted into medical schools to improve health care in South Korea. He said the government's plan to raise the medical school intake quota by 2,000 is a minimum necessary measure aimed at addressing a shortage of doctors with no room for negotiations or compromise. The president also sternly emphasized that there was no justification for the protests this reform had triggered. More than 9,000 young doctors, or about two-thirds of the total number of physician trainees in South Korea, walked off the job last week because of the plan saying the healthcare sector was not short of doctors and the government should address pay and working conditions first. Several ministers have threatened the protesters with legal action, including suspending their licenses, while also inviting the doctors to hold talks to end the dispute. Yoon, however, maintained the same hardline stance he took in the face of a strike by truckers in 2022 as the dispute started to disrupt supply chains and threatened to paralyze key industries. Texas, an independent country 200 years ago, now boasts a pocket of people who won that status back, advocating a separation they call Texit. Its advocates say the dramatic move, loosely inspired by Britain's Brexit from the European Union, would help resolve a roiling immigration border crisis and a fight with Washington over who controls the border with Mexico. That fight, pitting President Joe Biden, a Democrat, and Republican Governor Greg Abbott, has laid bare a rupture in America. When you look at the, the issues that we have between Texas and the federal government, um, it's pretty clear that the federal government can't be fixed. The easiest path for Texas to solve these challenges that we have with the federal government is just no longer be a part of it. In the 19th century, Texas was actually part of Mexico. But after a war of independence, the so-called Texas Revolution, it achieved sovereign status in 1836. Only nine years later did it join the United States as a 28th state. As Americans prepare to vote in November, most likely choosing between Biden and Donald Trump, the Texas independence movement wants the state legislature to pass a law allowing a referendum on breaking away. The U.S. Constitution, however, has no clause allowing states to do this. Indeed, the secession of southern states, including Texas in 1861, led to the Civil War, the bloodiest war in U.S. history. The European Parliament approved an EU flagship law to restore nature on Tuesday, salvaging at least part of its plans to protect the environment after farmers' protests ignited a backlash. The vote took place after weeks of farmers' protests across Europe, including a violent demonstration on Monday outside the European Union's headquarters in Brussels.
Among the protesters' complaints are EU green policies that they say impose excessive bureaucracy onto farmers. EU lawmakers adopted a law with 329 votes in favour, 275 against and 24 abstentions. It passed despite the European People's Party, the biggest lawmaker group in the EU Parliament, deciding at the last minute to oppose the law which they said would subject farmers to more red tape. The nature policy is said to be one of the EU's biggest pieces of environmental legislation, requiring countries to introduce measures restoring nature on a fifth of their land and sea by 2030. It aims to reverse the decline of Europe's natural habitats, 81% of which are classed as being in poor health, and includes specific targets such as restoring peatlands so they can absorb carbon emissions and help curb climate change. The policy now needs final approval from EU countries before it enters into force. A frozen Arctic vault built to preserve global agricultural crops from extinction received seeds on Tuesday from the largest number of new contributors yet. The Svalbard Global Seed Vault, set in permafrost caves on an island halfway between mainland Europe and the North Pole, was launched in 2008 as the ultimate backup for the world's gene banks to protect plants from war, disease and climate change. The vault has received samples from across the world and played an essential role between 2015 and 2019 in rebuilding seed collections damaged during the war in Syria. On Tuesday, depositors carried crates of seeds into the vault's entrance, a long narrow structure which juts out of the snow-covered hillside. 23 seed banks took part, nine of them for the first time, the largest number of newcomers introduced at one single location. First time depositors included seed banks in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Cameroon, Indonesia, Kazakhstan, Kenya, Madagascar, Nigeria and Zambia. The crates arriving on Tuesday contained crops such as beans, barley, cowpea, maize, rice, millet and sorghum, it added. With the latest deposit, 111 seed banks in 77 countries have a backup of their plants in Svalbard. The chambers, which are only open three times a year to limit the seeds' exposure to the outside world, boast temperatures of around negative 18 degrees Celsius. And in other news, the second day of the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona saw a diverse gathering of attendees from across the globe exploring various exhibits and engaging with cutting-edge demonstrations. The Congress also showcased advancements in electric vehicles with attendees experiencing firsthand the future of sustainable transportation through test drives and demonstrations. Additionally, new devices like the Samsung S24 smartphone offered people a glimpse into next-generation smartphone technology. Attendees could also immerse themselves in XR gaming experiences as well as new clothing design experiences that use AI, while Californian startup Aleph Aeronautics showed off their flying car. Discussions around AI dominated much of the conversation, with attendees keen to discern between hype and reality in the rapidly evolving field. The telecommunications industry is undergoing a profound transformation, propelled by technological advancements and shifting consumer expectations. In sports, Haaland returns to score sheet as Man City thrash Luton Town. Stay with us. Erling Haaland rode back to his best form with a five-goal salvo as Manchester City thumped Luton Town 6-2 at Kenilworth Road to reach the quarterfinals of the FA Cup early today. Luton had no answer to the marauding Norwegian who backed his eighth City hat-trick before half-time and then scored twice more after the break to kill off a stirring Luton revival. The 23-year-old Holland's first four goals were all created by Kevin De Bruyne. Mateo Kovacic also got on the score sheet for Holder City, who are unbeaten in 18 games in all competitions. Luton threatened an unlikely comeback when Jordan Clark found the top corner with a sublime effort on the stroke of halftime and netted again early in the second half. 
But the strong city side instantly found another gear to cruise into the head for the last eight. The night belonged to the unstoppable Holland, though as he became the first top flight player to score five goals in an FA Cup tie since George Best struck six for Manchester United against Northampton Town in 1970. Not looking good for Liverpool, as manager Jurgen Klopp said the injury hit English club needs a miracle with several prominent players in doubt for the FA Cup fifth round tie against Southampton. Midfielder Ryan Gravenberg, injured during Sunday's League Cup final victory over Chelsea, is the latest player from the Premier League leaders to be sidelined for this week's clash. But it's touch and go with a, bit, a lot of players still with the boys who are not available for the weekend uh, for the final um, this like Darwin Moore Dom we have to see uh, what they can do today um, Wataru got a proper knock as well there we have to see as well so yeah I wouldn't say it's much improved since Sunday um, but that's how it is the German coach credited the depth of the squad and its young talent for the way the team has performed this season, including the League Cup triumph. However, Klopp was concerned that a lack of recovery time could be an issue when facing Southampton, who are fourth in the second tier standings. And in tennis, Jakub Benchik continued his impressive form with a 4 6 6 3 7 6 win over current world number 31 and 2022 Cincinnati Masters champion Borna Choric in the first round of the Dubai Open yesterday. Fresh off a losing final run at the Qatar Open on Saturday, the 18 year old Czech showed plenty of grid, saving match point at 5 6 in the third set tiebreak to earn a hard enough or hard fought comeback win. The win is Menchik's fourth against a top 50 opponent in the space of a week at just his fourth tour level tournament and sets up a rematch in the second round with world number 24 and Dubai's eight seeds Alejandro Davidovich Fokina, who Menchik defeated in straight sets in his Qatar opener. Menchik's breakout performance in his Doha debut, which included upset wins over three time major winner Andy Murray, world number five Andre Rublev, and tour veteran and 12 time title winner Gil Monfils, before failing short to Karin Kacharov in the championship match saw the big serving Prostayov native become the youngest player in the top 100 of the ATP rankings when he rose up 29 spots to number 87. Yiri Lehetska, meanwhile, joins his Czech compatriot in the second round after securing a 6-4, 3-6, 7-5 win over Hungary's Marton Fuksovic and will face 4th seed Karin Kachanov next. Elsewhere, it was contrasting fortunes for two Italians as Lorenzo Musetti fell to French qualifier Artu Kazu, 4-6, 6-7, while Lorenzo Lorenzo Sonego booked a second round berth against top seed Daniel Medvedev with a 6 4 5 7 6 1 win over Indian yeah. wildcard Sumit Nagal. Australia's Christopher O'Connell also advanced past the first round with a convincing 6 2 6 4 win over German qualifier okay. Maximilian Matera. Meanwhile, world number four Daniel Medvedev down Kazakhstan's Alexander Shevchenko 6 3 7 5 on his return from a foot injury at the Dubai Open. Despite seeing his serve broken in each set, the 2021 US Open winner and defending Dubai champion powered past Shevchenko winning four games in a row at 3-5 in the second set to secure victory in under 90 minutes. The first round match at the ATP 500 event was Medvedev's first since the 28-year-old Australian Open final lost to Yannick Sinner last month. Having pulled out of tour events in Rotterdam and Doha with a foot injury and since the 20-time title winner improved to 7-1 to start the 2024 season. In another draw, fourth seed Russian Karin Kachanov stomped past France's Luka van Arsch, 6-2, 6-3, while fifth seed Hugo Humbert overcame fellow Frenchman and tour veteran Guy Monfils, 4-6, 6-3, 6-3 to advance to the second round. In motorsports, uh, Max Verstappen has led the Formula One standing since May 2022 and while Red Bull's triple world champion remains favourite for Saturday's Bahrain season opener, there's always a possibility of the record 39 race run coming to an end. The 26-year-old and Red Bull enjoyed the most dominant campaign ever last year with the team winning all but one of the 22 races. 
Verstappen, who started 2023 by leading Sergio Perez to a 1-2 victory at Sake, won 19 of them and surpassed Michael Schumacher's 2000-2002 record of 37 successive races in the championship lead. The judge driver signed off its seven wins in a row and the evidence from last week's pre-season testing in Bahrain suggested the streak was set to continue as the sport heads into a record 24-race championship. Red Bull are celebrating their 20th season, but the anniversary comes with a question mark over team principal Kristen Horner, who is under investigation for undisclosed allegations of misconduct toward a female colleague. Rivals will be keen to seize on any weakness, but are likely to be engaged in a battle to be best of the rest. Ferrari have shown encouraging speed and put in impressive mileage with Carlos Sainz going fastest on the second day of testing and teammate Charles Leclerc topping the final day's timesheets. The grid for the 20th Bahrain Grand Prix will feature an unchanged driver lineup. The race and the following round at Jeddah in Saudi Arabia a week later are being held on the Saturday to allow the Middle Eastern kingdoms to host races before the start of Ramadan. That's it from us. Wrapping up with a recap of our top story, famine imminent in northern Gaza. Melissa Tonight comes on at 8.30pm on TV1 and Saloran Barita RTM. Do join us there. And before we go, we leave you with visuals of James Bond rides throughout the years that will go on display at Washington Museum starting Friday. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. I'm Brendan LePaul. Stay tuned to TV2. Take care.